Welcome back to Principles with Corey and Logan. We got another awesome, awesome guest with us today. His name is Chris Payne, and I'm excited for you guys to hear Chris's story. He's, he's got an incredible story, but also he's doing a lot of things. I, from a distance, what I see him doing is he's making an impact, not on, only in lives, but generations. I, I believe he's doing some things that are going to set people up uh, to make an impact on their generations. And actually, I I kind of heard about him as a couple of years ago, we were doing, I guess it was maybe last year or so, we were doing a worship in the park and just trying to get something going. And I realized, I saw that Chris was doing something very similar. I was like, wow, I love, I love that. I've got to get to get to know that guy. So I just kind of connected and been following each other on social media a little bit. And I love his heart. I love what he's doing. And we just want to say welcome to the podcast, Chris. <clears throat> Corey, Logan, once again, thank y'all. Uh, for allowing me to be here. I'm honored to be here. Um, and yeah, like you said, I, that's the same with me. I remember, uh, I think it was in 2020, I uh, wanted to put something on outside, bringing people together. And uh, I was able to connect with the beans at barbecue by Jim and they let me use the bus stop. And, uh, <clears throat> so we just put on like an outside revival worship thing. And it was, you know, it wasn't a coincidence. The, the Lord, I guess, allowed it for us to connect because it was a week before the worship in the park. And, and so I believe it was great, you know, to bring all different types of people together uh, just for one common unity of worshiping the Lord, you know, the one who's over it all. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, Chris, uh, for those that may may don't know anything about you, may don't know your story or what you're doing, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your story, and what you got going on right now? Yeah, I, I definitely can. Um, you know, I'll try to make this, you know, as short or as simple as sweet, but we'll just kind of let it uh, go. My name is Chris Payne, as you know, and I have a ministry, me and my wife, called A Way Out Ministry. Um Long story short, that's a ministry that we have a heart and desire to help people find, you know, a way out of whatever struggle it is. It comes from the scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, Corey, that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. In other words, the hope in that is saying that whatever temptation, struggle, weaknesses, issues in life you're going through, you're not the only one that's going through it, you know, and others, the hope in it is others have went through it and others have overcame it as well. And because we can get in situations and struggles and and seem like we're the only one. And here we are. I'm never going to you know, get out of this and all these other different things. But hope comes when <clears throat> we hear a story of somebody else finding a way out, so to speak. It encourages the individual to say, you know what, if they can do it, maybe I can do it, too. And so it says there's no temptation that's overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And it says, and God is faithful. And we can talk about that for all day. But it says, and God is faithful. It says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. See, a lot of people at times get that scripture backwards. They think that, you know, God won't put more on you that you can't handle. That's not what that scripture says. Matter of fact, Corinthians tells us from Paul says that, you know, all this came upon me, all this struggle, all this hardship came upon me uh, to almost, I was almost facing death. The reason it came upon me, Paul says, is because I would no longer rely on my strength, but instead rely on his strength. A lot of times things in life do come upon us, but cause us to turn to a God who helps us overcome it. But this scripture says he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Sometimes I tell it people like this, you know, once you get set free or, or walking in freedom in whatever area of temptation life has on you, uh, we no longer have the excuse to say the devil made me do it. No, you know, God says, you know, I will not let the temptation be so much stronger that you can't endure it. He says, and, and he says, uh, and when you are tempted, not if, because Corey, Logan, we know that this world, especially the way it is now, will try to tempt us in any direction it can. And he says, and when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And so that's the hope that me and my wife have uh, is just going and letting others know that there's a way out. And, and it's not just with addiction. That's my story. And I'll get into that a little bit. But it's not just with addiction. It's just life struggles and issues. Maybe there's a couple that's that's on the brink of wanting to get divorced. You know what? Well, see, there's a way out of that. You know, maybe just maybe if we'll, we'll do things differently and, and get some counsel going through some things, there's a way out of divorce. There's a way out of loneliness. There's a way out of depression, struggles, life issues, anger, bitterness. There's a way out. And uh, and so that's just our hope with the ministry is any means possible 
helping others, whether it be through uh, preaching, speaking, evangelizing tools, uh, do revivals, lots of things in the community, um, and more things, but I'll get into that later. But the reason um, I have a heart for that is because Corey and Logan, that was my story. Mm -hmm. For years, for years, I wanted out. I dealt with a life of addiction. And, uh, and it all started at the age of 11, which is really, really sad to say because I have a son right now that he just turned 11 in September. And, and to think that when I was 11, I started using drugs. And, and we know that right now, uh, the way the, the world is, it makes everything glamorized and glorified of, of, the, of the sin in this world. And, and so I thought it was hard on me back then. It's a lot harder on people now especially with all the uh, social media tools, Snapchat, TikTok, all these other different things that fill your mind, especially the youth uh, with all types of worldly things. And so I started, it was at the age of 11. Uh, uh, I smoked weed for the very first time. And I remember it like it was yesterday. See, I grew up without a father. I, I didn't know my father's name, didn't know anything about him. All I grew up was with my mom and a um, my grandmother. She helped raise me as well. And so I didn't know it at the time, but now after working through some healing and, and other different things, I had a form of rejection from the very beginning. Uh, when my father wasn't there, I felt rejected. I, I, I didn't feel accepted, didn't feel a part of, didn't feel any of these things. So, so I started hanging out with the older crowd and hanging out with the older crowd would, you know, made me feel accepted. Um, if they wanted me to do something, I would do whatever just to feel cool, feel accepted and all those things to fill this void on the inside of me. And, uh, and so it was with my brother and his friend and they took me for my 11th birthday, uh, took me and my friend, uh, to the woods behind our house and, and introduced me to marijuana for the first time. And at the age of 11, I ended up smoking weed for the first time. Um, you know, so that just started kind of, you know, I, I tasted something and, it, and at the point at the time, you know, it was, man, it, it made me, you know, happy, joyful, all these other different things that I thought I was always looking for and, and, and would, uh, cause me to have an escape from the problems that I was going through and things like that. And, uh, and seemed pleasurable, which we know the word says that sin is pleasurable for a season, but in due time you know, it will lead to death. And, um, and that's exactly what it was doing. And, and so started at the age of 11, I ended up graduating high school in 2004. And, uh, and I am, I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, I had out of my immediate family, no one in my family had ever graduated high school. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to, I want to graduate. And I put my mind to it and I did. And, um, uh, but before I graduated high school, there was, when I was uh, growing up and a teenager and things, there was three things I said I would never do. And I'm just going to get vulnerable and transparent um, on this podcast. Uh, there was three things I said I would never do, which I, when I speak in front of to youth or even in any, any individual, you know, I'll ask them, hey, has anybody here ever said, you know what, I'm never going to do that. And then you ended up doing the thing that you said you would never do. Well, the three things I said I would never do, would I would never smoke crack, I would never steal from my family, and I would never shoot up. The sad thing is, y'all, before I graduated high school, before I turned the age of 18, I ended up doing all three of those. And it, it, it got a grip on me like never before. Like I said, I graduated high school, and then, uh, but I had this addiction already taken over in my life. Um, we then... I went to college, went to ICC, and I went to uh, Fulton, and me and two of my buddies got us in a, a house out in Fulton uh, going to college, and that's when things really, really got a whole lot worse. Uh, I put it in perspective like this when I tell people at times, imagine having a cat put in a, put in a, um, in a carrier, and you leave that cat in that carrier for a week, two weeks, you know, it's, it's, It'll uh, be calm while it's in that carrier and everything. But the moment you open up the cage or the door to that carrier and let that cat out in some freedom, 
the cat doesn't know how to handle the freedom because it's been locked up in that carrier for so long. And the moment it, it tastes freedom, it starts going wild and running all over the place. That's the, that's the same thing that happened with me when I stepped out in freedom on my own, had my own place and everything. It was just a party lifestyle. It was that whole freedom and I didn't know how to handle it. And it went down quick. Ended up going to jail for a DUI. And then I remember my mom telling me, uh, like I couldn't afford my bills anymore. So my mom let me move back in with her. And she told me, she said, Chris, you can move in, but, uh, but you've got to go to rehab. And, uh, and of course I was saying, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't have a problem, but they kind of forced me to go to rehab. So I went and it was in, I think maybe 2006, if I'm not mistaken, I went to my very first rehab. Um, and I tell people like this, I went to rehab because I had back problems. What do I mean? I mean, I had my family and the law on my back. So I went to rehab to get them off my back. <clears throat> and that's really the only reason I went. But when I went, there was something that was spoken to me. I went to the Haven House in Oxford, Mississippi. And it was a, I, I stayed for the whole 90 days. It was a 90 day program. And uh, while I was in there, I remember going to the classes and getting counseling and talking to individuals and and I remember like it really stuck with me. I remember getting on the phone with my best friend at the time. And I told him, I said, listen, I said, what they're talking about in here is real. And, and, and I realized I've got a problem. Like, wow, this stuff has been overtaking my life. And, and I can relate to what they're talking about. It really does have a grip on me. And I told him, I said, so I'm no longer going to do that. But the moment I get out of here, man, me and you are going to go to the bowling alley and we're going to get drunk. And so it was, boom, right then, the cycle of trading one thing for another, you know? Well, I know I can't do this, but maybe I can do this, you know? Or maybe I can do that. And so I'm, I'm a little hard-headed. You know, I learned a lot of things uh, from I, – I, I can tell you what not to do from doing the wrong thing and learning that way. But I thank God for his grace and his mercy that I didn't die in the midst of those lessons. And, um, and so – I went to rehab, I got out, and of course, you know, fell back off, and throughout from, I turned 20, yeah, I turned 21 in my first rehab, and from age 21 to 27, I, uh, I went to seven different rehabs, you know, that's almost one rehab a year, and uh, seven different rehabs, and in and out of jail numerous times, can't even count how many times in and out of jail, by the grace of God, I didn't go to prison, and uh but in and out of uh, county jails. Um, but there was a resounding uh, statement and a phrase that the rehab would always say, and they would say this. They said, change your people, places, and things. And that is, that is so true. Change your people, places, and things. And so I remember when I would get out of a uh, rehab, uh, well, the different rehabs I went to, let me say it. I went to uh, Haven House in Oxford. I went to... Harbor House here in Tupelo, which is now called Life Corps. I went there twice. I went to a place uh, called the Denton House down in the Delta. I went there twice. <clears throat> and then I went to uh, a place called the Potter's House. It was out in Pontesoc a while, like years ago. And then my last place I went to was the Russell Dream Center. But anyways, in all of them, they would tell you, change your people, places, and things. And so deep down, Corey and Logan, I wanted a way out. I really was. I was sick and I was sick and tired of getting up in the morning and seeing myself and 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 and, and like seeing destruction all around me. I, I didn't want that. I wanted something more. But honestly, y'all, I didn't see myself out of that. That's all I knew. I couldn't. That's why it says without a vision, the people perish. We've got to be able to see ourselves in that next level. We got to be able to see ourselves in that next season, because if we can't, a lot of times we can stay stuck in that same situation because we can't even believe in ourselves. And so, so in that, we ended up, um, uh, you know, change your people, places, and things. And so I would leave rehab one time. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay at my mom's house. I'm not going to go hang out with those people. I'm not going to go to those places or do any of those things anymore. You know, I'm just going to hang out at my mom's house. Just stay there. She's been my accountability and stuff. And, and y'all, it worked for about two weeks. Reason being, because I was there. I was 20-something years old. I was living basically at my mom's house on the couch and, and I was depressed. I was literally depressed, just living at my mom's house, just staying there. I didn't, so how did I handle the depression that was coming on me at that time? Only way I knew how to 
go back to drinking and drugging. So the cycle hit again. Boom, boom, boom. Back into rehab. Once again, the phrase, change your people, places, and things. Well, I would leave there like, okay, all right, well, this time I'm going to do the man thing. You know, I'm going to get me a job and I'm just going to, I'm going to work and I'm going to come home. I'm going to work and come home and take care of my bills and do all the things that, you know, a man's supposed to do, eventually get a family and all these things. Good intentions. Truly wanted that. Well, I started working at, uh, this was back in 2009. I started working at Hancock Fabrics uh, out in Baldwin. And uh, it's a factory there. <clears throat> and out of those hundreds of people there at that factory, I, uh, I was working on assembly line and I could draw near out of all those people. I could draw near and dear to that one other person that struggled with addiction. See, they, I, I didn't draw near to those ones that was doing good. I didn't draw near to those ones. I drew near to that other one that dealt with addiction as well. Bad thing about that is when I draw near to them and me and this individual's talking, we're not talking about all the bad times. We're not talking about the times that drugs took my family away, about took my life away. We're not talking about all the bad times. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about all the good times. Oh, we're reminiscing and having war stories of good times that we've had. And, and then in the conversations, you know, we're talking, oh, you know, what's his name? And, and we talk about who we know and the things that we're doing. And next thing you know, we find ourselves in the parking lot at lunchtime getting high. And, 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 and I say that, yeah, change your people, places, and things, of course. But the greatest thing in, in all of that, I could go to New Jersey, but guess who's going to go to New Jersey with me? Me. See, I, I'm the problem, you know? And, and, and like I tell people this right here, the problem's not the problem. See, a lot of times, a lot of people think that it's just the drugs and alcohol is the problem. It's not. Drugs and alcohol, matter of fact, was the solution to our problem. Why did I do drugs and alcohol? Because I was dealing with a deeper problem, a fear of rejection, all these other hurts and wounds. And so drugs and alcohol was my solution to the deeper problem within it. When the fact of the matter is, uh, I'll give you the ending of the story now in the middle. Uh, the problem was that I was separated from my father in heaven and I was living a life of sin and I was chasing this world, y'all. For, for something to fill the void within me, to give me love, to give me acceptance, to give me purpose, all these things that a human being is searching for that nothing was ever able to do it other than the love and the gentleness of my father in heaven. And, and so I chased after this world to find something to fill me. You know, if I get the right job, that's going to fix it. If I, if I just get married and, and, you know, get me a family, that's going to fix it. If I do this, do that, all these other different things, and it would work for a little bit, but then at the end of it, I still had that problem. I was, my family was going to fill the void. The job was going to fill the void. The, uh, the success in life was going to fill the void. All these other different things. And at the end of the day, I still felt empty. And so, so going back to when I was at Hancock Fabrics, part of my turning point in my story is um, as I was there, uh, my mom has done kicked me out. My grandmother won't let me come back. And so my brother, mind you, the one that originally had uh, uh, had me smoke weed for the first time, he let me move in with him. But by this time, he's done got cleaned up, doing good. And he knew my lifestyle. And he told me, he said, Chris, you can move in with me. He said, but the thing about it is you better not bring any of that stuff around here. I don't, I don't want none of it. Uh, we're not going to have it. And I said, okay. All right. And so I moved in with him, still working at Hancock Fabrics. And I remember it's 2009, two days after Christmas on uh, December 27th. It was payday. <clears throat> and my brother told me, he said, Chris, when you get off work today, you owe me rent. So when you get off work, come home and bring me rent money. Because he knew that if I didn't, I'd end up spending it. He said, come straight home and bring it here. And I was like, okay, okay, I will. Once again, y'all, good intentions. I really wanted to do it. And so I go to work, and uh, and as I'm there at Hancock Fabrics, you know, I'm thinking, about, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. <clears throat> well, I, uh, at the end of the day, about 3 o'clock, I get paid, and I don't know how much it was, maybe around $500, let's say. I got paid, and I was planning on leaving work, going home, or going to my brother's house and, and paying him. But when I get off work and I go out in the parking lot, guess what? Out of nowhere, somebody pulls into the parking lot, and it's people who know me that I used to run with, but not only do they know me, but listen, they know that I got paid that day. 
So when they pull in, they're like, hey, Chris, what's up? What's up? You know, trying to holler at me. And, uh, you know, I can't be I can't be mean and just ignore them. I got to say, hey, no, don't, don't. You don't have to. Don't give the devil a foothold. Amen. And so anyways, I went over there trying to talk to them. Next thing I know, I'm getting in the car with them. And so that's a little after three o'clock and uh, got in there with five hundred dollars. Well, eleven o'clock that night. Guess what? Five hundred dollars is gone. All the money's gone, and here I am. Boom! Oh my gosh, I've got to face my brother. I owe him money. What in the world am I going to do? I've promised him I wasn't going to do this. I, I, I'm not going to do it anymore. And here I am finding myself doing the one thing that I said I didn't want to do. And so I turned to the people I was with. I asked them, I said, hey, is there any way that I can just, you know, hang out with y'all tonight, this weekend, stay with y'all, whatever. I just don't really don't want to go back to my brothers tonight. And they said, man, Chris, we would love for you too. But unfortunately, um, we, we've got something else we got to do. We're not going to be able to let you hang out with us. We'll take you wherever you want to go, but you're not going to be able to ride with us. <coughs> and so it's funny to say that when the money runs out, guess who else runs out? Yeah, mm -hmm. those friends. And so I said, okay, you know, just drop me off at my brother's. And so they did. It was about 11, 11 that night. And I remember the light was still on, but I didn't want to face him. I stayed outside for about probably 30 minutes to an hour waiting on him to go to bed, waiting on the lights to turn off. Finally, when he went into bed, I went inside and snuck in, and I was living on his couch, and I laid there. I said, and, and I didn't grow up in church or anything. And so I laid there, and – you know, I said, God, if you're there, I, I, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to, you know, wake up. I don't want to, I'm sick and tired of it. my only way out at that point in time. Cause at this time I'm feeling unworthiness. I'm feeling guilt. <clears throat> I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling all these things within me. And my only escape, my only way out that I seen in my head, because I tried to get clean and sober so long was suicide like you know what i can't do it it's better off if they you know what i'm i'm causing more trouble to everybody around me me being here and it'd be better off if i wasn't here you know it, it'd leave everybody better so i go to the medicine cabinet and i find a uh, a bottle of extra strength tylenol and i grab them and i pour them out and i sit on the couch and i count them out and y'all as i count them i count out 70 extra strength tylenol and I grab all 70 of those and I just throw them in my mouth and I chew them up and I swallow all 70 of them. And then I just, I, uh, once again, I say, God, you know, if you're there, don't let me wake up. I can't face it no more. I just, I'd rather die. And so I passed out and about a, <clears throat> about a day later, the next afternoon, I woke up, my stomach hurting real bad. And my brother, the one day he decided to have a headache realized that all the Tylenol was gone. He's seen the empty bottle in the uh, trash can. He put two and two together. He realized that I had taken all the Tylenol and he called my mom and uh, I got up and my stomach was hurting. I ran to the trash can to try to throw up, but unfortunately I couldn't throw up. I hadn't eat, ate anything, you know, in a while. And so nothing was coming up. So my mom comes and gets me. She calls uh, poison control. And they tell her that acetaminophen poison is one of the worst poisonings you can have. Uh, <clears throat> it'll shut down your liver and all these other different things. She said, uh, get him to the emergency room as soon as possible. So I take the 70 Tylenol around midnight on Friday. Well, they finally put me in the hospital Sunday night at midnight. And I remember them pushing me on, on the uh, bed all the way up to ICU. And I look down the hallway and I see my mom talking to the doctor. And she just hits her knees and she just cries out screaming. And, uh, and I was like, what is going on? And so the doctor finally told me, <coughs> excuse me, the doctor told me, they said, Chris, um, don't know how to tell you this other than tell you, but the pills have already dissolved and headed to your liver. There's, uh, there's nothing we can do. Usually we would pump out your stomach, but we're not able to do that. We're basically just going to let you, um, keep you in here as comfortable as possible till your liver shuts down and you die and uh and see your enzyme liver levels in your liver i think i may be wrong but says it's supposed to be like around 100 or something well then the doctor told me mine was at 9,000, and uh and they said that uh you know i'm not supposed to live 
And uh, I said, okay, God, if this is the time, this is the time, I'm ready. Well, two weeks go by, and I pull out of it. Man, I pull out of it. And by, by the grace of God, I pulled out of it. But when I left that hospital, you would think, like, okay, I about died. I ended up in the hospital. I was on my deathbed. That's going to be the thing to change his life. Now he's going to do good. Y'all, when I left that hospital, I felt more shame and guilt leaving that hospital than I did when I went in. You know why? Because the one thing I was trying to hide from everybody else, now everybody and their mama knows. And so because, so I I just, once again, feel like a failure, feel like this, feel all these other different things. And so I end up, uh, um, end up leaving there and fall back into the cycle of addiction as well and <clears throat> end up going back to rehab. But uh, there was something that happened at this rehab that really uh, is part of my story that stuck with me. Uh, I went to a Harbor house, which is uh, it's a secular program and uh, meaning that it's not a whole bunch of faith based stuff. They don't talk a whole lot about God or Jesus or anything of that matter. Uh, and so we were there and one of the guys in the program, he had told me, he said, we started talking about prayer. And he said, Chris, man, I want to tell you a story. I said, okay, what is that story? He said, he said, man, my wife is a, is a nurse at the emergency room. And there was not long ago, there was a guy that came in there that had taken a whole bunch of pills. And she's the nurse that would give him the fluids. And the doctors had told her that, you know what, he's probably not going to make it. And, but you know what my nurse, I mean, what my uh, wife did? I said, what'd she do? Before she took the bag of fluids into that individual, she got all the doctors and everybody to come over that bag of fluids and to pray over that bag of fluids. And then she took that bag of fluids to that guy that was going to die. And guess what happened, Chris? I said, what? What happened? He said, and that guy made it. And I looked back at him. I said, guess what? guy?" I said, guess what, Mike? I said, you know who that guy is? He said, who? I said, I am that guy. I am that guy. And that left an imprint on me. You know what? Even when I didn't believe in myself, somebody else believed in me. Even when I wanted to give up, somebody else gave, I mean, somebody else was, was praying for me. I thank God for a praying mother. I thank God for a praying grandmother. I thank God for prayer chains and other people that didn't even know me, but said, you know what? I know that there's a power within God that can redeem this man right here. And because of that, man, there was, there was, you know, I was saved that, I mean, I was, uh, I was, you know, I didn't die that night. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, it's because of the prayers, because the enemy had tried to take me, take me out. And so to, uh, to get down towards the end of this, the very last rehab in 2013, I, uh, like I said, my cycle, 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 cycle. And there's a whole lot more in between all that, but those are just key points that I like to let everybody know. But uh, at the very, um, in 2013, I'm in my cycle again. And uh, my mom had let me live back at her house. She done lost everything, lost everybody. And uh, I've got two kids at this time. Don't have them. And so my mom's let me live there, but I'm still in my addiction. I remember it was on March 4, 2013. I get two phone calls. And it was uh, one phone call was from the boss, my boss man that I was working with. I was doing construction at the time. <clears throat> he called me. He said, Chris, he said, I know you stole my pills. Um, he had pain pills. He said, I know you stole my pills and uh, you need to come down here and turn yourself in. If not, I'm calling the law and you're going to jail. And of course, at the time, I denied every bit of it. Um, I was like, no, 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 I didn't. I didn't. And uh, and so I, he was fixing the call the law on me. Then I got a second phone call and it was my mom. And she told me, she, she said, Chris, today's the day. <clears throat> I'm done with you. I'm sick and tired of it. When I get off of work, you need to be out of my house. I don't care where you go. I don't care what you do. I don't care what takes place, but you're not doing it anymore. You're out of my house. And, and, uh, and, and I thank God for that tough love that she showed me that day because, you know, when, when, when everybody else would pull me out of my mess, guess what? I wasn't turning to the one that could pull me out of my mess. I, I had to have that tough love to where I couldn't turn to nobody else. I had to turn to the one that could set me free. And so, so I'm in that cycle again that day. I get that phone call. And then somebody tell me, somebody told me about the Russellville Dream Center. A matter of fact, Dodie Vale, I don't know if you know Dodie Vale, but uh, she, she was a lady over NCA Double D uh, here at National Council of Alcohol and Drug Dependency downtown. And so anyways, 
I called her. I said, hey, I'm needing to do something. And she said, yeah, you do. I said, I said, what do I need? Where, do I, where can I go? And she made this statement. She said, Chris, you've tried all these programs around here, and none of them has worked for you. And she said something that she didn't know was going to change my life for the rest of my life. But she said, because I, I tried all these secular programs. And listen to me now. I'm not knocking secular programs at all because God uses all different ways to bring people to him. He can use any. He used the donkey. You know what I'm saying? He can use anything to bring people to him. So I'm not knocking any of them. They planted a lot of seeds. But she said this. She said, Chris, you've tried all these secular programs. You need to try something different. I said, okay, what? She said, you need to try a faith-based program. I said, whatever. I, I don't care. I, I'll do whatever, you know. And, uh, and so she told me about the Russellville Dream Center. And it was the only program that was a faith-based program that was everything was centered on, on the word of God, the biblical truths of how to handle life on life's terms with biblical principles. Hey, principles with Corey and Logan, huh? And uh, and so so I called the Russellville Dream Center that day. And I remember I broke down on the phone with them. I said, hey, you know, this is going on, this is this and that. And uh, they said, okay, you can come. You can you can come in. You gotta be here today at six. They said, you gotta be here today at 6.30. And then at, at that point in time, I started backtracking. I was like, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up. I gotta be there today at 6.30? Like, I, I can't come today. I gotta take care of this. I gotta do this. I got all these other different things I gotta do. I can't come in today at 6.30. And uh, you know what? But I thank God for it today because if I wouldn't have went in that day, I couldn't promise what was gonna happen the next day. That's why he says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week. I'll get to it. We can't guarantee today is the day. And so I remember going there. My mom took me, dropped me off, and she told them, this is in Alabama. She said, listen, I'm done with it. If he decides to leave, don't call me. He can be on the streets in Russellville. And so she she left, and, uh, and I was in there. And I remember, y'all, when I went in there, I didn't wake up that morning deciding to go to rehab. And this is for somebody, if somebody listens to this. I didn't wake up that morning deciding to go to rehab. I didn't wake up that morning deciding to want to change my life. No, if the truth be known, I woke up that morning still wanting to get high, still wanting to do the things that I wanted to do. But pressures and other things in this life. But I went to rehab that day because I was running. Once again, I was running from my problems. I was running from the law. I was running from no place to live. I was running from all my problems. But I thank God that when I was running from my problems, little did I know as I was running from my problems, I was running to a God that was ready to take me in to help me overcome those problems. And see, you may feel like you're running from something right now. But look, you can run, but you can't hide. I promise you, the reckless love of God will pursue you to, to chase you down because the divine purpose he has on your life, I'm telling you, his grace and mercy will cause you to end up stopping what it is that's trying to kill you. And so I went in there and uh, it was a six month program. <laughs> the whole time I decided I'm just going to do six months and I'm going to leave. Well, six months ended up turning into five and a half years. I ended up staying there. And, uh, you know, when I first went in, I, uh, you know, I tell people like this, I didn't have Jesus himself sitting beside me, you know, the pictures of Jesus with the long hair. I didn't have him sitting beside me, you know, telling me what to do or anything I, uh, that, that caused me to change my life. No, I seen Jesus in somebody else. And when I seen it in somebody else, because listen to me, I was wanting a way out. And deep down within myself, I was struggling and wanting some hope, wanting some peace, wanting some, wanting something of this life. And I seen it in somebody else. And when I seen it in somebody else, I said, you know what? I want what they got. And that caused a hunger and a thirst for righteousness on the inside of me, not to chase after that man, but to chase after the God of that man. See, I know Corey and Logan, y'all do a lot about leaderships and principles and things like this. One of the biggest things is a servant leader. I seen a servant leader. And when I seen that servant leader, I want what they got, you know, and it, and it caused me to run after that. And like I said, y'all, six months turned into five and a half years. I, uh, I ended up getting me an apartment there in Russellville, Alabama. Uh, by the grace of God, I got full custody of my uh, my oldest son, joint custody. I mean, my uh, I got joint custody of my oldest son, 
full custody of my middle son. And so God has restored all that. That's why I was living there in uh, Russellville, Alabama. But I wasn't planning on coming back to Tupelo. It was not, uh, it was my stomping ground. It was, I was afraid that, you know what, I would come back here and I would end up falling back off. So I cut ties with Tupelo and I was going to plant in Russellville, Alabama. Well, in 2018, I remember the Lord uh, kind of speaking to me or just kind of, you know, um, like I, I felt strongly the Lord speaking to me in 2018 as I was, you know, you know, at the beginning of the years, we usually, uh, we usually, you know, self-examine and, you know, if you're, you find yourself, okay, God, what do you have for me this year? You know, what do you want me to do this year? And, and we, we truly look in and seek the Lord on that. Well, as I was looking into it, I realized that the number eight meant new beginnings. The number seven meant completion. The Lord was speaking to me in 2018. I didn't know all this. In 2018, was telling me, Chris, I'm making everything new in your life. In 2017, there was a lot of things completed in your life. And now in 2018, I'm fixing to do something new in your life. And, and I didn't know what that was. And then on April 4th, 2018, in a worship service, <clears throat> I felt the Lord strongly pressing on me, Chris, I don't want you here anymore. I want you back in Tupelo. I got people in Tupelo I want you to reach. And Corey... That was the uh, biggest step of faith I have ever taken was to leave my comfort zone, to leave everything that had basically helped save my life. That five and a half years there at the Russell Dream Center, the ministry, I became an ordained pastor. I became a student pastor, associate pastor. I was a director over the program, all these other different things. And, and, uh, and for the Lord to call me out of that comfort zone into a land of the unknown, kind of like Abraham, he did that. He said, hey, I'm bringing you out of this to a land that you don't know about, but I'm fixing to do something, you know. Uh, and so so I had to step out and uh, and stepping out in that, man, the Lord has, I, I mean, we, we could talk all day about it, but I'm not going to. But all the things since stepping out in 2018, coming back to Tupelo. Uh, the Lord has done has I've now got uh, uh, I, me and my I met my wife started going to Anchor Church and uh, and I met my wife she's a the secretary there Kayla Payne was was Kayla McGee now Kayla Payne and uh, you know I, I never I always dreamed to want to have you know a family and a life and all these other different things but you know once again never knew if I could even obtain that because a life of failure within myself and so I had uh, now, you know, I'm married. I own my own house. Uh, I do construction. I go around ministering, preaching, uh, help with the ministry. I've got, um, um, uh, uh, we just had a baby, you know. I got a four-month-old baby now. And, and, and it's, it's, man, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But in that, in that transition from leaving from Russellville to Tupelo, I remember as I was searching, I was, I was scared, scared to step out, you know, and, and I remember the Lord speaking to me as I was uh, uh, studying one morning. It's just like in Joshua. Joshua's one of my favorite books. Uh, the Israel, I mean, the, uh, the priests, where they, Joshua is where all the people, the Israelites are stepping into their promised land. They're fixing to finally step into it. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and here the Lord calls the priests to step out into the Jordan. And he tells the priest, he says, step out into the Jordan. And, and the waters was rushing. The waters was, was high out there. And the Lord said, step out. And once the waters come up to your knees, he says, and then I will part the water. And see, the Lord was speaking to me because I was like, well, Lord, where am I going to work? What am I going to do? What are all these what ifs? You know what I'm saying? I want to get everything just right. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, Chris, you need to step out into the water first. And when you step out into the water, I'll then start parting it. I will show you <clears throat> and instruct you in the way you should go. And you're talking about something that builds faith is when you step out in faith and you start seeing God slowly here and there. You know, God's not going to be a, 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 a map. He's going to show you all of it. Somebody told me he's a compass. He's going to point you in the right direction. And uh, and so that's kind of been my heart and, and my story. And real quick, and uh, I'll end on this part right here, a way out. How a way out birth is uh, in 2017, 
uh, I had a friend I grew up with, one of my best friends growing up. Well, he ended up dealing with addiction as well, in and out of prison. Well, this last time he was in prison, he was in there for six years. And he, um, 2017, in October, he got out. Uh, he'd been out of prison for a little bit. And uh, well, I get a phone call in October 2017, <coughs> and it was his mom. His mom, uh, he had got shot, uh, shot and killed. I don't know. You may have heard about it. It was there in uh, Plantersville or, or Nettleton. His stepdaddy shot him. They were fighting, and then the stepdaddy accidentally pulled out a gun and, and said he was trying to shoot away from him. They accidentally shot him. Long story short. Uh, he, he died. The mother had to try to keep him alive in her arms until the ambulance got there. Unfortunately, he died in his mother's arms. So she called me. She said, Chris, uh, will you preach his funeral? And I said, I, I would be honored to. And, uh, and so I was like, what in the world can I say at this funeral? You know, what, like, what hope can I give? See, mind you, I'm living in Russellville at this time. Nobody in Tupelo, the funeral is in Tupelo. And, and, and the people that's going to be at the funeral is all the people I used to run with, the ones that are still in addiction, the ones that are still in that lifestyle, they're still struggling and all that. And so here I am in Russellville. Last time any of these people here at this funeral had seen me, I was in my mess. When they heard the name Chris Payne, they wouldn't think of a preacher. No, they were thinking of a crackhead. When they heard the name Chris Payne, they were thinking of a junkie. You know what I'm saying? And so the Lord had set this up for me to come do this funeral. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, what am I going to speak? What do you want me to say? Last time these people seen me, they seen me in my mess. The Lord said, Chris, I want you. And when I say the Lord said, I mean, he did not an audible voice like, oh, Chris, you need to. No, I mean, you get this prompting on the inside of you through the spirit. And um, and so I just felt the Lord telling me to uh, let everybody know that there's a way out. There's a way out. And, and, and because of that, the ministry has been birthed from one of my best friends passing. And, and even though he may have died in addiction and lifestyle of addiction, God does not waste a life. Our father in heaven is still using my best friend, my friend's life to change other people's lives. Last, just last year, I just sent out a fruit report. Matter of fact, Corey, I just sent yours out. You may get it in a couple of days, but, um, uh, but just even in that fruit report, you know, last year, just through a way out ministries, uh, since May, there's, uh, we've recorded about 126, uh, salvations, you know, through the different revival, through the different speaking engagements that we do different events or, or just even one-on-one -on -one with individuals on the streets or in a store or in a restaurant, we get, I get, I made a, a way out track that I give out to people you know, to let them know the hope that there's a way out. I, I have these shirts, bracelets, and other tools that people use. Like when you're walking in Walmart, somebody may see that shirt, a way out. What does that mean? Boom, it's an open door to share the gospel with somebody. Because you never know the hope that, that you telling somebody else your story, what you went through, or just a story or whatever, the loving grace of our Father in heaven and, and what it can make an impact in somebody else's life. And, uh, you know, and so through that, I, I hope that maybe I've been able to do that a little today on this podcast for anybody who listens. I probably went way over time, but I kind of get excited about this stuff. If you can tell, hey, you know, Chris, <clears throat> man, I think that's awesome. I, I you know, we, we did a did a uh, podcast a couple of days, well, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the guys was talking about intensity and how he was intense and how it pushed people away, but. You've got passion, man. Passion is attractive. And, and I love what you said. God never wastes a life, man. What you said right there, I truly believe that people are going to be set free from listening to this, but also listening to your testimony. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. And I, I believe there are going to be people listening to this. And I, I believe change is going to be uh, broken off just by listening. And one of the things that you mentioned, you talked about a way out. He, if somebody else can do it, that means I can too. And in Revelation, it talks about the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, right? And what that means is what Jesus has done in somebody else's life or what he's done before, he's willing and can do it again, right? So your testimony is the spirit of prophecy. And, and man, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, go for it, man. And, and, and I, I say this, and once again, Lord knows my heart. When I say this, I don't say this in, in a boastful sense at all. Uh, my wife was, we were talking to my son about it last night. 
as well. But uh, so so today I'll run into individuals at Walmart or or just here in Tupelo that knew that old Chris Payne. And, and, and like, for instance, probably about a month ago, we was in Walmart. I ran into somebody I used to know from the streets back then. It was him and his girlfriend. And uh, you could tell that he was kind of struggling a little bit, but he wasn't just going to open it up and say it right then. But he looked at his uh, girlfriend right then. He said, listen, he said, now, I, now he's one of the worst ones I've ever seen. And if he can do it, I know I can do it, you know, and, and, and that, that's the hope that I want to give, not like, oh, Chris Payne, when you think of a way out, I don't want you to think of Chris Payne or Kayla Payne or anything. I just want you to think of the hope that, man, there is something greater. There is there is a way out. There is hope in overcoming whatever this life tries to throw at us. And, um, you know, and so that's, uh, it is, you know, uh, the testimony is powerful. It's the uh, spirit of prophecy. And, you know, if he's done it for one, he'll do it for another. Yeah. I got a quick question for you, Chris. And I know Logan's got one too. I can see it on it. I can see it in his eyes right there. But a question I have for you. And uh, my mama's, my mama may listen to this and she may get mad at me, right? Because I, I see my brother in the same kind of place you were in. I want to go back to your mom. You said that tough love. Can you speak to parents or, you know, you, you love, obviously your mom loved you. But she said, that's it. I, I'm done. Can you speak to a little bit about um, maybe parents or friends that may be not showing tough love when they need to? You got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, lots of them. But just quickly, it's, uh, you know, it's we can love is uh, we can we can easily um, enable without us even understanding that we're enabling. Mm -hmm. uh, a fear of that within the person that loves someone like I, I haven't went through it myself with my son god forbid i ever go through this with my son but but the fact of the matter is you know i know that the enemy will try to tell you well if you do that you don't love them you know if you if you stop this or if you stop stop helping them and, and, and the addict himself or the person struggling will reach out and will make you feel that way and say well you don't love me you don't this you don't that don't listen to it it's a lie because deep down, you've done everything that you know that you can do, right? Well, see, but the moment you continue to put money in their hands, a lot of times that's money that's going to help kill them if you're not careful. I've heard it like this. Your love, if not careful, can actually kill them if you're not, you know, careful with that. Um, I said it earlier in my story. It was a tough love. When my grandmother would bail me out, when my grandmother would give me a place to stay, when my grandmother would do all these things, guess what? Why would I need to change? Why would I need to deep down change that within me if my grandmother's going to continue to give me what I'm trying to need to change from? Or, or my mom, you know, if I call her and I'm in jail or if I call and I'm struggling with this and I need money or anything else, if she's going to bail me out of that, why in the world am I going to need to run somewhere else to get help if mama's going to do it for me? Mm. The only way that you can truly allow somebody to get the help is, listen, I can't do it for you, but I know one who can. And, and, and in that, you know, they hit, you heard rock bottom, you know, when you hit rock bottom, you got nowhere else to look but up, you know, and they're not looking to mom or grandma, they're looking to the one who can truly give them and set them free. And, and uh, the also, I, I know all that I say is easier said than done. And something that's on my heart, and, and, and Corey, maybe somebody listening to this can uh, a key in or something, but part of a way out as well that's been on my heart over this past year because I see vision and growth, but I don't want to get ahead of God. But one of my visions for a way out as well is to have something set up for, for parents and loved ones uh, that, that struggle, that have loved ones that struggle with addiction. Because not only is the one that's struggling with addiction needing help, but the ones like the mamas, the daddies, the parents, the loved ones, they need support as well. They need a support group. They need help in, in, in dealing with some things, dealing with the hurts that they're dealing with, dealing with the struggles and the things that they're going through. So prayerfully, um, I'm seeking out to try to set something up for that, for parents and loved ones to have have a support group or, or have some type of community like that that can help one another out. That's awesome. Um, there's just a couple of, um, things that I wanted to, to touch on, uh, from your story. And then from, from what you guys just mentioned one, and I don't know what this is, what this connection is worth, but just something that I noticed, uh, something that 
Corey talks a, a lot about and that, that you mentioned um, was that great things don't happen in your comfort zone. Um, and, and exactly what you just said is um, sometimes families um, or support systems or whatever it may be in various um, areas of life provide a safety net uh, that, that keep us from, in, in this situation, hitting that rock bottom and knowing that change was needed. But also, I think it, 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 it also applies in the area where you said the Lord wasn't going to part the water until you stepped in. And so sometimes we want that safety net and we don't want to walk out into faith. And so I think that it works different ways, but there are some areas of life where we can uh, make some really positive changes if we will get away from the safety net. Not saying take lots of unnecessary risk or anything like that, but you've got to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. And sometimes um, those things hold us back from from achieving what we're, we're, what we're called to do. Um, the other thing is you mentioned earlier, not letting the devil get a foothold. Um, on the on the flip side of that, you've created some tools like the bracelets, like the shirts, um, different things uh, where people better not give Chris uh, a chance to get his foot in the door because he is going to kick it down and he is he, he is going to capitalize on that opportunity. I was I was thinking before uh, before the call, I was. Um, I was reading through some of my notes of, of traits that I want to have. And the very first one is that I'm a, uh, one of the affirmations is that I am a seeker, seer, and seizer of opportunity. Uh, and I think that I'm going to edit that to I'm a seeker, seizer, and creator of opportunity because you, you are uh, really uh, being intentional about creating opportunities uh, to get the message out. And I love that. I think we could all do uh do a much better, a much better job of being intentional about creating those opportunities because um, the way I have it written is a little more passive and you are out there every single day looking to make a way uh, to share your testimony. And uh, I think that's, um, that's why uh, we can't control the number of salvations, but it is an awesome validation to see the Lord work when, when we're obedient. Uh, and, and those those uh, those lives that were impacted just in the past year. So that's uh, that's awesome. I mean, Logan, uh, first off, thank you for that. I mean, uh, that was an encouragement that I needed because <clears throat> a lot of times we all know it doesn't matter, you know, how good you're doing in, in whatever trade you're in, whatever <clears throat> area of life you're in, you go through those bouts and those moments that you're like, am I even making a difference? Am I this? Am I that? All these other different things. And and, and I thank God for encouragement that comes throughout those times. And so <clears throat> thank you for that encouragement, Logan, to uh, uh, definitely uh, continue to light that fire within me. Like I said, it's definitely nothing to do with me. Desire is whether it be creating opportunities, but it's almost like a, a an individual that's got a product, not only creating a, a, an opportunity, but I, I, I want to create an opportunity to place in your hand to be able to go out there to do things. Does that make sense? Like when I give people, there's many testimonies. I'll share them sometimes of uh, like with the, where people have used the bracelets or, or the shirts or the tracks or anything themselves and was able to open up the door to, uh, you know, give hope to somebody else. And you were saying that you got to step out your comfort zone. Um, when I said that my mom told me that day, uh, Chris, you, uh, I'm done with you. Today's the day. Get, get out of my house. I, I can't do it. That was a Jonah moment. <clears throat> do you know what I, what I'm saying is, uh, I was on the ship <laughs> and, and I was, I was going my own direction. I knew the Lord may have had a calling on me, but I was doing my own thing. And little did I know as I was doing my own thing, I was creating havoc all around me to the people around me. And they finally stood up and said, I've got, I, I, there's enough. Your havoc is coming on me, and I'm not having it no more. Get off my ship. Kick me overboard. And I thank God that they kicked me overboard, got me out of the comfort zone, because then God's grace and mercy through a belly, through a, through a whale for Jonah in the belly of a fish came in and grabbed me, which was the dream center at that time. That was the belly of the fish for me. I wasn't able to go nowhere or do anything. I had to sit and, and, and let God do some work on me. And a lot of times we don't allow God's grace and mercy to uh, take on somebody because, you know, we're still keeping them in the ship. 
but get them out of their comfort zone. A last illustration that our preacher talked about two Sundays ago was uh, in the Bible somewhere. It talks about where Moses seen uh, a mother eagle rousing her nest, rousing the nest. In other words, in the nest, like flapping her wings like this, creating a bunch of havoc and chaos within her own nest and where the babies are. And so he went into the story to tell us the reason for that is a lot of times the baby eagles can get so comfortable in their nest that they don't, and, and they can even step over the edge of that nest when it's real high in the sky, step over and look and, and see how scary that drop is or feel the wind and easily want to get right back in the hole and sit in their comfort zone. But it wasn't until the mother comes in there and rouses the nest and shakes and brings chaos that it causes the baby eagle to get on the edge of the nest and then eventually jump off to spread its wings and fly. And then once it spreads its wings and fly and realize like, wow, I can do this. Now, mama's still watching them. You know, father, our father in heaven is still watching us. You know what I'm saying? If we stumble and fall, his grace and mercy will pick us back up. But it's not until the nest is roused up to push us out of our comfort zone to show that we got wings ourselves that we can fly. Hey, Chris, um, <clears throat> I know we're about to wrap up and uh, I want to I give you an opportunity for somebody who really uh, would like to contact you to uh, see how you may be able to add value to them. Uh, I'd love for you to share that. But there was a post you made. You mentioned that you guys had a, uh, a newborn or you just recently had a child. There was a post you made that really made an impact on me the day you guys were in the hospital. And you, you made a post where it was a side-by-side -side post where when you were in drugs and alcohol and you guys had, you were, you were at the hospital with your baby. And then you had a side-by-side -side of your baby now while you're clean. And the words that you used in that post were in, in this first one where you were in drugs and alcohol, where you got the call and you were getting high in the moment and you show up and the baby's born and you're getting high. You, you were high there, but in your mind, you were thinking, how am I going to get out of here? Like what's an excuse I can use to get out of here to go get some more, right? Your, your newborn child is just born, but that was in your, in your mind. And now you're clean and you, we, we can see that. <clears throat> and I, I thought that was so amazing because your thing was drugs and alcohol. There are other people who are addicted to anger. There, there are other people who are addicted to maybe some kind of website or, or whatever. And you're saying there is a way out. And you're not just saying it because you read a book, right? You're not just saying it because you read a cool article uh, in some magazine. You're saying it because you live it, man. And you got an opportunity to impact the lives of other people. So if there is somebody out there that, um, man, I, I really need to talk to Chris. I need to reach out to Chris. What is the best way? For them to get in touch with you, Chris. Yes. Uh, well, the best way they can get in touch with me is <clears throat> on Facebook. My, my main platform is social media on Facebook. Uh, Chris Payne, parentheses, a way out. Uh, or you can reach out to my wife as well on there, Kayla Payne. <clears throat> uh, my email, cmpayne2014 at gmail.com. Uh, and then also my phone number area code, I still have my Alabama number, area code 256-324-8415. And so those are just the uh, main ways uh, to reach out to me. Hopefully within 2022, there'll be more ways, uh, and I'll let people know about that then. But you just said it about that it's not with addiction, it's not with – it's not any specific thing. It's just life issues at time uh, that overtake us. Uh, during my study this morning in Romans, and I do also, if you're on Facebook, I do a lot of Facebook, five, like five to six minute devos in the morning. So if you'd like to catch those out, you can. It's on Facebook. But the one this morning was uh, <clears throat> from Romans 7 where Paul was saying, saying like, I don't, I don't know why I do the things that I do, you know, like the, when I want to do right, I end up doing wrong. The one thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing the thing that I did. The thing that I want to do, I find myself not doing what a wretched man I am. 
And, and I know that there's individuals that feel that way. It doesn't have to be addiction or, or anything. Maybe it's you being frustrated at your wife or you being frustrated just at life in general. And, and you know, and you just say things that you don't need to say or, or do things that you don't need to do. You find yourself doing what you don't want to do at times. And, and, uh, and he says, but it's not me. It's the sin that is within me. And we got to understand, I put this post, we was talking to my son, Brayden, last night. I grabbed his hand. I said, son, when you do little compromises or when you do like little sins or, or tell a lie or, or do little things, you're shaking hands, so to speak, with the enemy. Uh, basically, you know, casually shaking hands. And as you're shaking a hand, I grabbed his hand <clears throat> and I just casually shaked his hand. In other words, you got control of that handshake right then, so to speak. But the moment you tell that lie, I get a little bit, I get a little bit firmer grip. Then, then you, uh, you watch something that you don't need to watch. I get a, another little grip, or you start talking about things you don't need to talk about. I got another grip. Then, then all these other, and I just get grip after grip until I had a grip of his hand. And I said, "Okay, son, now you can go." And he kept trying to pull. He could not pull away from that. And I said. I said, that's the thing. It's now got a grip on you. And the only way that you can break free from a grip that's stronger than you, you can't do it because you're not strong enough to break that grip. If you could, you could. The only thing that you can do is find something stronger than you to break, break, break that grip. And Isaiah 59, 1 tells us this. Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is ear too deaf to hear you call. It's through God and through, through the power of Jesus Christ to help you overcome those things. But even though then you may need somebody to help you walk through those things out. Uh, uh, on, on the track, uh, I, on the track, I, I, um, I don't have one with me right here somewhere. Yeah, dude. Um, can I it, just give me three minutes? Can I explain this track real quick? Okay. All right. Well, so this is a track that the Lord had placed on my heart uh, to make a way out track to hand to people. I don't know the first thing about it. Didn't know it. Uh, and so I just started writing some stuff out. And then I was like, okay, what do I do with it now? I went to copy creators. I said, hey, I feel like the Lord had told me to make a track here. And I just gave him a bunch of scribble on some paper. I said, can y'all put this together for me on something? They said, yeah. And about a week later, they came up with this track. And, uh, and, and, and it's been, I've been seeing fruit from it. But anyways, it talks about, you know, on the front, it says, um, have you ever felt or thought any of these? This is how it will always be. This is the life I've always known. The struggle's real. No one will help me. Too far gone. I honestly have a hard time wanting to let go. Just things like that. And it says there is a way out. It talks about that for just a moment. It says the only true way out is through Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But this is the part that I want to talk about. There's three, way, the three ways to find your way out. Three steps. The first step is don't try it on your own. You got to accept Christ. You can't do it on your own. If you could, you would. And then right there, it's got scripture and it's got a little prayer that if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, you can. And um, but here's the thing about it. a lot of people stop right there. Just because you've accepted Jesus into your heart, that's not the, that's not going to fix everything. You're still even more now going to face more temptation, more struggles. It's going to be a lot harder. The thing about it is you got something greater on the inside of you. It says, um, after accepting Christ, the temptations of this world try even harder to pull us down, which leads us to step two, ask for help. We now have someone on our side who understands what we're going through and desires to help us. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this, this high priest, which is Jesus Christ, uh, understands our weaknesses. He faced all the same testings and temptings we did, yet he did not sin. And because of that, we can come boldly to the throne of grace of God and we will receive help and mercy in the time that we need it the most. In other words, it's saying that Jesus understands what you're going through. He, he says, I felt the same temptations and testings this world, yet did not sin. And because of that, you can come to me and ask for help. And then it gives a little prayer. The very last step says this, make a move. Acts 12, five through eight says this. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up, and the chains fell off his wrist. 
Then the angel told him, now put on your coat and follow me. Peter was also in the same place like us, feeling like there was no way out, bound up within a prison like some of us feel. But the church prayed for him. And then on the card, it says, just like we've prayed for you reading this. <clears throat> it says, as Peter was in that place, the angel of the Lord, being the Holy Spirit, started nudging him to get his attention and showed him a way out by saying, quick, get up and follow me. Peter had received freedom in that place, but he still had to make a move, just like us. We can be free from that struggle, temptation, or issue, but if we don't make a move in a different direction, we end up going back to the same place. As you have read this, maybe you've had that nudge telling you you need to get up and do something different, but you don't know what to do. Well, if that's the case, reach out to us, and it's got our information right there on uh you know how to get up, up to us because a lot of times people say yeah jesus will do it for you and he will but sometimes you need help on doing something as well and if that's the case reach out to somebody and and, and that's what a way out has as well resources and connections i don't i don't desire to be the one to want to help you but i i see ourselves as a connector you come into us so to speak, like struggling with this, struggling with that, need help with this, blah, 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 blah. You know, okay, great. I know the great resource for you. I know here, let me connect you here. Let me connect you there. Let me get you set up here or whatever to help succeed for the individual to uh, find that freedom. Yeah, that, that's, uh, man, that's incredible. And I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story today. I, I really believe what you shared today is going to help some people. And I love what you said at the very beginning. You used some scripture that the things of the world, hey, man, they sound pleasurable. They lead to death. That, that's where you found yourself. And you had, man, if we had time, I'd love to dive even into the lady who, who had the boldness to grab people, the doctors, you know, the nurse who grabbed the doctors and everybody to pray around that bag, man, that, that is the power of prayer. So, but I, I really appreciate you. Hey guys, if you're listening, uh, if you, if you have uh, a need like that, feel free to reach out to Chris, find him on social media. His uh, ministry is a way out. Also, if anything that there is in here that stood out to you, make sure to comment. We'll pass that along to Chris and uh, share this share this episode. I truly believe that uh, chains are going to be broken. So anyway, Chris, appreciate your time. I uh, hope I bless you and what you're doing. And guys, we thank you for taking a listen. Hope you have a great day and God bless. <music>